Day 105 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Happy Monday, friends. If you're studying with us in real time, welcome back to Bible study. Excited to begin a brand new week with you all. And if you are new here to this Bible study, we welcome you. Please let us know in the comments where you are studying from, and we hope that you are able to stick around. So make sure to check out our description box or our show notes. Lots of information in there. Probably will answer most of your questions. You can always check out our website, heartdive.org as well. But if you are a part of the Heart Dive fam and you're back for more, please, please hit that like button. It's not for my own good. It is just so that we can get other people involved in Bible study and into the Word of God, because we know how important that is. We know how it is life-changing, it's changing our hearts. And so every time you hit that button, it's telling YouTube, I need you guys to send this video to other people who are searching for Bible study. And if you want to join us in our connect groups, our online small groups, you can join us in our Facebook group. That's where we schedule them all out. Everything, all of those links in the description box below. Otherwise, we are in the book of Psalms today. David, one of the greatest psalmists in the Bible, and all the psalms that we're reading, or at least most of them, are surrounding the stories that we have just been reading in 1 Samuel. So we'll be kind of skipping all over the place today, but before we begin, we are reading from the ESV by Crossway Translation, and we're going to go ahead and pray and prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, we love you. We just give you all of the praise and the glory and the honor. We're excited to be able to read the Psalms today, Lord, because reading these really helps us to be able to develop a wonderful prayer life. If we don't know where to begin or how to pray, this is the perfect place to start. And so we thank you, Lord, as you begin to write these prayers on our hearts, that you will continue to expand our mind, our understanding, our wisdom, our knowledge of the word and of who you are. That's the most important thing, Lord, is that we are developing a relationship with you because that's what you want first and foremost and above all. I ask that you please forgive us of our sins. Lord, will you wash us clean right now? Anything that is holding us back, anything that we have done that has crossed the line, stopped short, or just plain old missed the mark. Will you reveal those things to us if we're unaware, Lord? Forgive us, oh God, and we repent of those things. We do not want to remain where we once were. We want to be changed from glory to glory, to do good, to be able to honor you with our entire being. Help us also to forgive others, and please do not lead us into temptation. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start off here in Psalm chapter 7, known as the Psalm of the Slandered Saint. And of course, we know that in 1 Samuel, David is on the run from Psalm, everybody chasing after him, falsely accusing him, attacking him. And so this is what the Psalms of Lament will refer to. I don't know what your Bible says, but here in the notes, it says a Shigeon of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. Now, we don't know who Cush is, but a Shigeon, this is is a very obscure word. Some of the meanings of this that some commentators have said is that it means either a loud cry or a meditation, but nevertheless, this is a psalm of lament. So he starts off here in verse one with a testimony and a prayer, speaking of the confident trust that he has in God. Oh, Lord, my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. So we're going to kind of take these Psalms chunk by chunk. Whenever we see that he is taking refuge, this is typically referring to a picture kind of like of a bird that is hiding under the shadow of its mother's wings. And we see here that he has very human emotions. That's natural. That's a good thing because, you know, he trusts in the Lord at all times, but at the same time, he's still very fearful. And that is normal for us. It makes us feel better that we are not abnormal for being fearful of anything. But really what matters is what we do with that fear. If we are going to turn it to trust in the Lord, or we're going to allow that fear to kind of break us down because the enemy is like a lion. He does want to tear us apart. And the best way he's going to do that is come at us with all of these accusations. He is here to steal, kill, and destroy. And his favorite thing to do is to stand before the Lord and accuse you all day and let the Lord know what you're doing wrong as if he doesn't already know. But watch what happens. Verse 
3. Oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. So here he is protesting his own innocence. Now this is very important to catch that he is not declaring himself being completely righteous or sinless. He is just saying in these matters in which he is being accused, these are the things that he is innocent of. So he is vindicating himself in a sense, but at the same time, willing to accept the judgment of God. And anytime you see this word here, sila, this basically means pause, think about it, meditate on what this is saying. Verse six, arise, O Lord, in your anger, lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples gathered about you over it return on high. So this is a plea for for God's judgment. And when he is saying, arise in your anger, this is, please, Lord, be the judge that you are. Look at what they're doing. They are doing wicked things. And I am righteous in this matter. And when he says, awake for me, he believes that God is indeed for him. Verse eight, the Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is within me. So he continues here holding on to his innocence and appealing to Yahweh or Jehovah as judge. Now, only someone who is confident in their innocence could say something like this. Lord, go ahead and judge me because he is the judge of the universe. He knows all things. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. So he is declaring here that God knows all, sees all. And when he says you test the minds and hearts, he is speaking about the innermost being of a person. Your translation might actually read hearts and kidneys. So he's not wanting favoritism here. He's just wanting justice. My shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. So he's declaring here that God is his defender. God is his attorney, just the same way that Jesus is our attorney, our advocate. So anytime the enemy is up there saying, look at what she's doing. Did you hear about what he did? I am prosecuting her for this. Well, Jesus is sitting there saying, Father, I paid their bond already. They are forgiven. They are innocent. They are clear. So you can acquit them. Isn't that amazing? I get so excited about that every time I read it. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. So he's not feeling angry over us and our sin. He is feeling angry over the wickedness of the world that is unrepentant. Verse 12, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. So now he is condemning the wicked here. He has bent and readied his bow. So up to this point, God has been withholding his judgment by his mercy, and he has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. By the way, his arrows do not miss. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull, his violence descends. So in other words, evil is going to give birth to evil. It's going to continue and eventually destroy itself. So God is not going to allow evil to persist forever. Verse 17, I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. And I love how David ends his psalms of lament where he is sighing about what is going on in his life with praise, a declaration and a testimony of who God is and what he will do and how he will deliver. So notice that he is appealing to God's righteousness and not his own anymore. So he ends this on a high note. He doesn't go to Facebook and start ranting. He raises a hallelujah. So in the end, this Psalm is a cry for the justice of God upon his enemies. And David is falsely being accused and attacked and chased after. And he has no other place to run except straight to the Lord, because that is his only chance for deliverance. Nobody else is going to save him. And note that David never declares himself innocent because he knows that he isn't, but he's not asking for mercy for his sin. He's asking for his vindication. And this is really important for us to catch because sometimes the thing that will keep us from completely surrendering to the Lord is that fear that we're going to be judged or that we're somehow not worthy of asking for such a thing because of our own guilty conscience. So the fact that David understood God's justice and his love before he ever demonstrated it to the world through Jesus, this was why he could so freely and boldly come before the chambers of God to plead for justice. So what about you? Heart check. 
Are you able to freely come to the Lord in all matters? Is there guilt that is holding you back from completely surrendering and boldly entering into His throne room of grace? So now we are heading over to Psalm chapter 27. This is a confident psalm of trust. Starting right here in verse one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So he's declaring straight off the top, I will not fear. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rises against me, yet I will be confident. So David's confidence didn't come from the fact that he slayed Goliath or defeated the enemy. His confidence came from the fact that he had nothing to hide. He trusted in the Lord as the light of his life. So there was no sitting in darkness. You know, he let that light flood in, cast out all fear, all doubt, all sickness, all rejection, all evil. And we can't say that the Lord is our light and salvation and yet keep the door or closed on certain parts of our lives, because that's allowing darkness to just kind of lurk in the deepest corners of our hearts. And that darkness is the very thing that is going to keep us shackled in fear whenever the enemy does come. So David was confident because he allowed every single part of himself to just be exposed and ugly before the Lord, you know, knowing that he could hide nothing from him. So heart check, have you let the light in? Is it exposing every corner of your heart? And now I'm going to have that song in my head. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? Verse four. One thing I have I asked for that the Lord will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever or all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, this reminds me of that age old question. If you could just have one wish, what would it be? And I don't know that many of our answers when we were younger was to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. (laughs) Yet this is David's one thing that he is asking for. He wanted to be able to see him in fellowship with God. So as we grow closer to the Lord, and it's the same with us, the closer we get to the Lord, the more we're going to want him over anything else. But if we were to ask ourselves honestly today in this heart check, What is the one thing that you would ask for if you were granted one wish? And when he says he's dwelling in the house of the Lord, he's talking about the tabernacle. So this was a physical place, but it was because the glory of the Lord was there. And when he says he will gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, this beauty speaks of the pleasant nature of God. Verse five, for he will hide me in his shelter. Again, that picture of that bird under its mother's wings, speaking of safety and security here, in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. So if anybody's getting irritated with my praise breaks, it says right here, I will sing and make melody. We all should be doing that. We all should be offering songs of praise to be able to celebrate the blessings that God has placed in our lives. I annoy my children too, so don't feel bad if you feel irritated. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. And my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not. O God of my salvation, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. So here David is praying for God's continued presence in his life and he's still having that human emotion here when he says, when I cry aloud, but he knows that seeking God's face is his highest purpose at this point. And he's not wasting any time. When God says, seek my face, he's like, right there, Lord, here I am to seek your face. So he is desperate. He needs the Lord and he knows it. And I love how he always relies on God's past deliverance in his life to trust that he will be there once again in the future. Verse 
verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path. Because of my enemies, give me not up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. So here we have this prayer for continued trust. And he is saying, Lord, teach me. I want to be discipled by you. So he wants to live God's way, not his own way. He doesn't want an easy life, but a stable one. That's what he's speaking of when he says, I need a level path. One where when the storms come, I know where my feet are going to go. I'm not going to be tripping over a bunch of rocks. Verse 13, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, when he says in the land of the living, he's basically saying all my life, as long as I am living, I will see the goodness of God. And there is plenty of bad in the world, but there's still so much good. God's goodness can be seen everywhere. We just have to be able to open our eyes to it. It's really up to us what we're going to focus on. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Gosh, I love Psalms. I love them so much because we come out of this deep, dark place of all of these wars and just kind of depression. And I love that we get to see God and His goodness and David declaring, just wait for Him. Victory is about to come. Breakthrough is on the way. So he has this confident expectation and we too can take heart in that. And if anybody knows about waiting, it's David. I mean, he was anointed as a teenager, but he didn't actually become king until, I don't know, like 15 years later. But he didn't just sit back and be depressed about the fact that he wasn't king yet or that God wasn't fulfilling his purpose. No, he sat at his feet. He sat at the door and waited. He was active. He was training. He was still shepherding his flocks. He was getting a lay of the land. This is why he was successful in his wars and in his victories. And so strength and courage doesn't just passively come. It's available to all of us, but we have to actively seek it out. And that word wait actually means to hope. And to hope means you have a confident expectation of the coming good. And now head on over to Psalm 31. And this is a psalm that is an emo roller coaster. We are going to go from lamenting up to a praise and back down to depression and back up again to exalting the Lord. So keep an eye out for that. But what's interesting here, and this is why I love this psalm so much, it's because it's just a picture of our lives. I mean, if our lives are not an emotional roller coaster, right? Not everyone is smooth sailing throughout their entire lives. We all have our ups and downs. And the reason why I got so excited reading this today is because I remember when we were in songwriting workshops for a worship album and our pastor was telling us, I don't want any sad, depressing songs. I don't want any woe is me songs. I want songs that declare God's righteousness, goodness, faithfulness, majesty, which is amazing. I think that that's incredible. But I I was saying, man, but our church has so many broken people in it. There are people who are feeling these real feelings. But because I was told that for a very long time, if I ever heard a song on the Christian radio station or a worship song that was talking about our emotion, I started becoming bitter and saying, that's not a real worship song. All worship songs are supposed to only praise God and focus on Him. There's truth to that, but not only. We got to take out that word only because here we see that this particular psalm was intended to be sung out loud. When we see it says to the choir master. That means that this was a psalm of lament that could relate to the people who were broken or feeling depressed and down and out, and then they could rise up together in praise to God. So let's take a look at this. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. And so when we hear this word, incline your ear, it's kind of like a parent who can't hear their little baby. And it's like, what did you say, honey? And that's what the Lord does to us. In his compassion, he just comes down and he listens to our prayers. He hears our heart's cries. And so that's exactly what David is doing here. He is crying out for help. But at the same time, in that cry, he is declaring his trust in God. Verse three, for you are my rock and my fortress and for your name's sake, meaning for your character's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net that they have hidden for me for you are my refuge. Into your hand, I commit my spirit. And if you have read the Bible before, you know these words because these are the very words that Jesus spoke right before he took his last breath on the cross. And we also heard Stephen utter these words right before he was taken up into heaven. So this phrase is a declaration of total trust and surrender. But notice when they speak it, 
is right before they die, or in Stephen's case, right before he eternally lived. So whenever we receive Jesus, this is what we are ultimately declaring, because we are saying, Lord, we are committing our full selves to you, the deepest parts of our souls into your hands. And this is our way of entering into that path toward eternal life. But we have to surrender everything to Him with that complete trust and dependence. So we are essentially just handing over our lives and relinquishing all control. So heart check. Have you committed your spirit into His hands? Or are you still trying to control certain parts of your life? So he continues, you have redeemed me, meaning you bought me, O Lord, faithful God. So you can do anything you want with me. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. So he's comparing the worthless trust in those idols to the trust that he has. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love or your mercy because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. And this is a really powerful couple of verses right here because this tells us that God sees us, He knows us, He answers us, and He gives us safety and security. Verse 9, be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. Now, these are classic words right here of a psalm of lament. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. So here he is down at the bottom once again in his despair, feeling not only physical pain, but also emotional distress. Sounds very similar to the words that Job cried out. And some commentators have said that it was possible that David was very sick at this point. Verse 10, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach. So socially experiencing distress as well, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. Now, I can't even imagine that people were doing this to David, but They were. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. So he's feeling very rejected at this point. I have become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. It's almost like they're treating him like a monster, you know? And this is mortal distress now. I mean, it's coming down to life and death. Here we go, back up the hill again. I trust in you, O Lord. So you say, my trust is greater than the trouble that I'm facing. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands, meaning his youth was in the hands of God, the present time in the hands of God, and he knows that his future will still be in the hands of God. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine upon your servants. Save me in your steadfast love. So that line there, verse 16, sounded like the priestly blessing that was spoken in Numbers chapter six. He may have borrowed that line the same way we borrow lines from the Bible to pray. You'll hear lots of familiar lines today in our prayer. Oh Lord, let me not be put to shame for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to Sheol, meaning to the place of death. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. He is appealing again to the justice of God. Oh, how abundant is your goodness. So here we are at the top of the mountain once again, praising God, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you. In the sight of the children of mankind, in the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men in that secret place. You might have that written in your Bible. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I had said in my alarm, I'm cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you saints. So now he's saying, join me. He just can't keep it to himself here. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. So we end there on a high note. And as we turn over to Psalm chapter 34, another one of my favorites, lots of really good nuggets in this Psalm. This was right after he acted insane and his spittle was running down his beard and onto his clothing. And he acted like a maniac so that they would release him. And whenever we're speaking of Abimelech here, remember this was actually a title for King Achish. So this is a Psalm of wisdom and praise. 
And this psalm is actually written in the Hebrew, of course, in an acrostic form. So, an acrostic is basically like an acronym. So, it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but in the Hebrew alphabet. The only Hebrew alphabet that will be missing is WA. Is that how we say it? W-A-W. And that one will be missing after verse 5. So, the purpose of acrostics was for memorization or for teaching. It would be easier to remember, just the same way it is for us with acronyms, right? So, we start off here in verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, the word bless here actually means to confer happiness or prosperity unto another. So, if he is saying he's going to bless the Lord, it might be kind of hard to believe, but we actually have the ability to make God, the creator of the universe, God Almighty, happy. We bless his heart. And we do that whenever we come to him with that gratitude and that praise. And I love how David purposes in his heart that he will bless the Lord continually, no matter what. And he will maintain a heart of gratitude throughout it. And remember when I said that studies actually show that gratitude is intrinsically linked to happiness. So, C.H. Spurgeon actually said, he who praises God for blessings will always have blessings for which to praise God. Whereas those who have an attitude of ungratefulness or I'm lacking this or I need that and God's not giving it to me, they're going to think they have no reason to praise the Lord because they cannot see the blessings that are right in front of them. So, heart check. Have you purposed praise in your heart no matter what may be? Verse 2, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So here he is again, calling upon the people to praise God together. And we can quote Psalms and phrases without ever truly thinking about what they mean. You know, when you hear something over and over and you just kind of spit it out. So for example, when we say something like magnify the Lord, you probably imagine making God bigger. But the thing is, we can't make God bigger. You know, He is what He is. So, whenever we magnify something, think about using a magnifying glass. You're not actually changing the size of the being. What you're doing is you're changing the perspective of how big that being is. So, whenever we magnify the Lord, we are being given an opportunity to change the perspective of Him and His greatness. And right now, the world is just trying to diminish God and make Him smaller. So, we need to be a people who are changing that perception. And David is wise to call upon the assembly to do this together because we need each other. Whenever we get around like minds, we are encouraged. Our understanding is increased, and there is a general sense of of unity or oneness. Whereas if we are torn apart and we're just tearing each other down, that magnifying lens, it gets shattered. It's totally out the window. So heart check. How do others perceive God through your life? Are you magnifying him? Verse four, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. So this is classic Psalm verbiage for praise. I sought the Lord and he answered me. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. So when he says that they are radiant, this is that picture. Remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai and when he would come down and the glory of the Lord would just be radiating off of his face? It's the same way that when we spend time with the Lord, we too will be radiant. I feel the most beautiful that I've ever felt in my life, and I am not talking about my exterior. I am speaking about the interior, but I tell you what, when your heart changes, when the interior of your spirit changes, there is a beauty that comes out and exudes in the physical. I truly believe it. I see it in people all the time. Whereas stress and anxiety and worry and bitterness, those things will actually start to physically make you look older. So the best anti-aging regimen is Jesus. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. So when he says this poor man, he is just speaking of the needy and the humble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. And anytime you see the angel of the Lord, a lot of the time that is referring to Christ. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. This is one of my favorite lines in this psalm. And notice that taste comes before seeing. That's totally backwards. You know, in the world, it's like, show me first and then I'll take a bite. 
I mean, I used to live in the show me state of Missouri, you know, and that was kind of their MO. It's like, you got to prove it first and then I might believe you, but not with the Lord. He says, come taste, come take a bite, come drink of the living water and then you will see the goodness. Then your eyes will be opened up. Then the spirit will start to fill you up. Then you will have joy. Then you will have peace, but you got to taste first. And this was Israel's purpose in the Old Testament. They were supposed to be the ones who tasted the goodness of God and were able to show it to the rest of the world. Verse 9, O fear the Lord, you and his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Now, this fear, of course, is a response to God's goodness, a response of awe and wonder, worship and reverence. So, it isn't being scared of the Lord. And this is not rooted in feeling. This is all about action. Verse 10, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And notice that it doesn't say those who seek the Lord lack nothing. It says no good thing. And that is because he truly is all that we need because he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us better than anybody else knows us. He knows exactly what it is that we need. He knows what is best for us. When we're seeking him, he is going to make sure that we get that. And sometimes it can be a little bit painful, the best things for us, right? So whenever we feel like we need something, I need it. We really got to ask ourselves, do I really need it? Is it good for me? And is it God's best for me? That takes faith to be able to trust that the Lord is going to give you what is good for you whenever you're seeking Him. Come, O children, listen to me. So notice he has taken on the role of a wisdom teacher here. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So if you ever wondered, what do I do? What is it like to fear the Lord? What does that look like? Well, here's your answer. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? So if you want good, then here are the instructions. Keep your tongue from evil. Well, isn't that amazing? You know, it's your tongue that is going to give you a long life because in the power of the tongue is life and death. And when he's saying keep it from evil, he's talking about all kinds of things, uttering curses, having filthy language, gossiping, slandering somebody, trying to tear them down, criticism, and your lips from speaking deceit. So no lying. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And if you obey this, really, you will be able to encompass all of God's commandments to turn away from evil and to do good, to seek peace and to pursue it. See, again, peace isn't passive. Yes, we get the peace that surpasses all understanding from the Spirit of God. But if you want to be able to keep that peace, to hold on to it, it's going to take some work. You're going to have to pursue after it. You're going to have to maintain it. It doesn't just stay there when we remain stagnant. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cries. So here we see the care and protection of God as he watches over us and hears our cries. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. This is one of the most comforting verses that we could ever write on our hearts because It is oftentimes in our brokenness, with our broken hearts, through our tears, where we feel like God might be the farthest from us. But really, that is when He is nearest. That is when He is saying, I'm here for you. You might not be able to see me right now through the blurriness of your tears, but I am wiping them from your face. He is our comforter. He cares for you. So really, brokenheartedness and feeling like you are crushed, these are actually objects of the mercy of God. It's not Him shunning you or allowing you to be attacked. This is all for the purpose of him being able to pick you up and bind you up and hold you up and build you up. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. So this right here is prophetic, speaking about Jesus when he went to the cross and none of his bones were broken. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Now, this last verse here, also out of the acrostic, and this just sums up this entire psalm. If you seek God and if you seek refuge in him, there will be no condemnation, just as Romans 8, 1 says that those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for them. So, this is, in a sense, prophetic as well. 
And lastly, now heading on over to Psalm 52, another Psalm of Lament, following 1 Samuel chapters 21 and 22, whenever Doeg, the Edomite, ends up confessing what he saw with David and Ahimelech. And right after that, Doeg went and slayed 85 of the priests after he told Saul what happened. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? Now that's a little bit of sarcasm there because he's talking about Doeg. So we know Doeg's not a mighty man, just a mighty mass murderer is what he is. The steadfast love of God endures all the day. So in other words, good will always prevail over evil. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. So here we see God's word indicting Doeg, meaning his motive was malicious. He didn't just go to Saul and be like, I'm just reporting to you, sir, what happened when I was over there. No, he knew what he was doing. He knew that it was going to destroy David and the priests. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God, love that, but God, I'm going to circle that, will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. And this means that you will die. Evil will not prevail. So this is a proclamation of the divine judgment of God on evil. Verse six, the righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him saying, see the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. So this right here kind of tells us that he may have done this for some money, but David is saying the righteous are going to see this and they're going to have a deep respect and awe for God. And laughing at his destruction is not laughing in the face of his death so much as it is laughing in celebration of the justice of God. Verse eight, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. Lots of symbolism of the olive tree in the Bible. In fact, if you have any information on that, if you want to kind of give us some of those symbols of the olive tree that you know of from the Bible, put those in the comments because I would love to start a conversation about that because I think this is a really beautiful line that I didn't spend a whole lot of time on. So I am like an olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. So once again, David ending a psalm of lament with a beautiful declaration of trust in God that he will do good. And because so, David continues to purpose that praise in his heart. So taking a look at some of our deep dive questions. Compare earthly judges with the Lord as judge. How do they compare? And how are they different? How do you reconcile God's judgment with His love, mercy, and forgiveness? What does it mean to dwell in the house of the Lord? What does that look like for us? How does David's relationship with the Lord inspire your relationship with Him? And how do these Psalms model prayer and praise? So Heavenly Father, you are our rock and our fortress, and we take refuge in you today knowing that you have saved us from us, from the worst of ourselves, and from heading down a road of destruction. And while the enemy may continue to accuse us, you are our advocate. You are our helper, our refuge, and our righteous judge who has already pardoned us and set us free. So our bond has been paid, and we thank you for that, Jesus. We know that we are never truly righteous, nor will we ever be by our own merit, yet you still give us a new name and you continue to call us by it. We are the righteousness of God. I pray that we will do our best to live that out for others to see. Will you maintain our integrity so that we can walk with our heads held high and not in pride, but in a posture that gets others to look where we are looking, and that is up at you. When we do that, a radiance that has never been seen on us will shine forth because your glory will be revealed. I pray that others will be able to taste and see that the Lord is indeed good. And God, we know that we cannot understand why evil prevails in this world, but we will trust you, knowing that you will right every wrong one day and that you will bring judgment upon those who are wicked. But we also recognize that you are mercifully waiting on every heart to turn to you. So we ask that you will arise, O Lord, and help them to see you. And thank you for being our shield in the meantime. If any wickedness is coming our way, we trust that you are our defender and we thank you for this divine protection in our lives. We declare today that you are our light, our salvation, so we don't need to fear. 
No matter what battles we face or what insults might come our way, we will not stumble or fall, but we will remain confident because you have already brought us through the battlefield before and you will do it again. So one thing we ask and seek today is to indeed be able to dwell in your presence forever. There is no other place we'd rather be than under the shelter of the shadow of your wings. Thank you, God, for lifting us up out of harm's way and onto a rock out of the enemy's reach. And for anybody who feels like they are crushed or suffering, maybe broken in their mind or their bodies or their spirits, will you let them know that you are near to them? They may not be able to see through their tears, but increase their faith so that they can walk by faith and not by sight. We continue to seek your face, O oh God, our helper, our comforter. And we know that when we seek you, no good will be withheld from us. Teach us your ways, lead us on a level path so that we do not stumble. And with you, we can walk through this life on equal footing. You never promised that it's gonna be easy, but you did promise to never leave us in this life. So we will set our focus on you as you guide us while leaving us a set of footprints to walk in. And until the day you call us home, we will continue to gaze upon your goodness and faithfully wait for you. We will not wait in apathy or laziness, but actively wait in prayer, in service with humility and with expectancy. So help us to be strong and courageous as we watch for your every move with anticipation. And as David so beautifully depicted what unwavering faith and trust looks like, I pray that we will do the same. We want our lives to be an example for others who can trust in your love and your divine protection, no matter what they're going through, because you're always there. We thank you, Lord, for seeing us. Thank you for hearing our cries and for continuing to lead us and guide us. And we thank you for the honesty and integrity of David and the way that he showed us how to pray and how to praise. We can now come before you in complete honesty with all of our raw emotion because you already see it anyway. So help us to continue to be open and honest before you. You're not looking for perfection in us. You're just looking for relationship. So I pray that we will bring every hurt, every ounce of worry or distress, every sickness, every disease, every moment of rejection before your throne. We bring you our all, the good and the bad. So into your hands, God, do we commit our spirits today as we give you all the thanks and praise and honor and glory. And we declare that we will sing praise to the Lord Most High, magnifying you and exalting you all the days of our lives. We bless you and love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short. And then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.